The topic today is the Old Idaho State Penitentiary. It was a functional prison from 1872 to 1973, east of Boise, Idaho. The first building known as the Territorial Prison was constructed in the territory of Idaho in 1870, a full two decades before statehood. The Old Idaho Penitentiary is operated by the Idaho State Historical Society. And our speaker today is Anthony Perry, uh, interpretive specialist with the Idaho State Historical Society, and apparently a close neighbor of Gary Heath. So uh, Anthony, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. All right, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, and you can see my presentation on your screen as well? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I am an interpretive specialist at the Old Pen. I've been here about seven and a half years, digging up stories, going through old prison records, prisoner files, warden's reports, uh, guard log books, all kinds of different things, kind of uncovering stories. And yeah, right now, actually, if you're looking at this screen, uh, this building to the left, that's actually my office. And that front window there is my, my window that I'm looking at right now, but my computer. So it's a pretty uh, interesting job to work in a historic building like this. Um, as he said, the prison was active 101 years, 1872 to 1973. Prior to that, uh, this land was actually uh, sacred ground. It still is sacred ground to Shoshone, Bannock, Northern Paiute, groups that would gather here during the summers, uh, during Chewaukee fairs and trade and have ceremonies and different things. And every year, the Shoban tribe, they actually gather under Eagle Rock and uh, have ceremonies. Um, so it's still a very important area. But, you know, gold gets struck and miners and everybody else start flocking to Idaho and with it comes crime. And so we needed an area to house all these criminals who were stealing horses and robbing miners and doing all kinds of shenanigans. So on the 4th of July, 1870, a cornerstone was laid for a territorial prison, 20 years before Idaho becomes a state. And part of the day's celebration on the 4th of July was laying the cornerstone. And you can actually see it here. There was a time capsule in there. And the citizens of Idaho, ironically, on Independence Day, all came out here to watch the laying of a cornerstone for a prison. Um, pretty interesting, 100 years later, prisoners were actually set to write a history of the prison and they, they heard about a time capsule in one of these buildings and they didn't realize which one was the territorial prison. So they walked around with a metal detector and around each corner and finally uncovered this. So here you can see the last warden, uh, Raymond May, next to this guard here is a pretty infamous individual named um, Joseph Munch. And they're <laughs> pretty excited to pull that out. And some prisoners helping them pull these, uh, this stone out. And right here, this middle photo, you can see some of the artifacts that were left in there from 1870, 100 years prior. A lot of those are still in our collection. Now, the prison, they finished it by the end of 1870, but there was debate on who should, who should pay for it, the federal, government, you know, the United States government or the territorial government here in Idaho. And so it kind of sat for about two years. And finally, they decided this joint measure to, to share those costs. And it opened up in March of 1872. And it was just this single building, no wall, nothing else. So all prisoners were required uh, to have a ball and chain on if they were allowed outside their cell. Within the first month of the prison opening, we actually had our first escape. This fellow named Al Priest was in on a highway robbery charge, had a 15-year sentence. This was not his first, uh, his first crime here. So pretty, pretty hefty cr crime. So he's outside of his cell. He's kind of helping stack some rocks. And he asked an officer to go inside to get some water. And as he went inside, he found a pair of keys. He unshackled his ball and chain, climbed up and out the window, and snuck off and up through the foothills. Not long after, guards kind of discover, one of them goes inside, he sees the ball and chain on the ground, he sees the window open, he yells, escape! And the other prisoners were outside, they were kind of digging away at a ditch. They had, uh, had them all run to their cells with their balls and chain on, they lock the doors, and these two guards that are on duty, they run outside, they see this dust cloud going through the foothills, so they chase after it. And they forgot to lock one cell. 
this, this Chinese man named Ah Hood, who is convicted with assault with intent to murder, his cell slides open. He starts looking around. He sees a ball and chain on the ground with the key still in it. And he pulls out the key, unshackles his ankle, climbs up and out the window, and is never seen or heard from ever again. So this is our very first escape within a month of the institution opening up. Uh, and a reward went out for Mr. Al Priest, a pretty renowned uh, criminal here in the 18. 1860s and 1870s, and he was actually tracked by a U.S. Marshal and shot and killed and buried right where he, he fell off of his horse. Pretty intense early days. So finally, five years into the prison's history, they finally built a 12-foot wooden fence and it had little uh, guard towers on each corner, and that allowed the prisoners a little bit more freedom inside the yard, uh, raising chickens and other things. There are a lot of escape stories. Um, there was a chicken coop right next to the, the fence. And prisoners who were working in that uh, coop were actually dumping water on the fence, just waiting for it to get rotten and moldy. And finally, they did it long enough that they could actually kick through the boards and just burrow underneath and run off. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of escapes in those early days. Now, everything at this prison, I mean, everything in Idaho, you were convicted to hard labor. You were expected to work. And Part of that hard labor was working in the quarry, blasting the stone out of the ground. And the quarry was actually up just above our prison is this big mesa called Table Rock. And there's a big cross up on that hill. You can definitely check it out yet if you haven't been out here. But that's where the stone quarry was. And there's plentiful, plentiful uh, sandstone up there. And so the prisoners were sent up there. There would be a guard with a shotgun and basically about 12 prisoners at a time blasting the stone and bringing it down in these large slabs and then building the wall and everything else around them. So you can see some of these prisoners working away. Uh, they did this up through the late 40s was the last time that they started blasting stone. And then from the 50s onwards, all the buildings became cement. So the early history, all sandstone buildings, and all constructed by prisoners. Now, in the mid 1870s, the Native American groups, they were being rounded up and sent to reservations. And this caused a lot of strife. And this fellow, Tom Biago, he was the very first execution at this institution. And basically, he had a brother who he thought was wrongfully convicted. And he was angry, he was upset, and he decided to kill the first white man that he crossed paths with, which was this uh, rancher named Alex Roden, pretty uh, well known in his area. And Tom Biago was captured soon after and sentenced to hang. He was brought out here to the territorial prison. And uh, his is the only one where there were actually witnesses. So during his execution, about 250 people came out to the territorial prison to witness his execution in the pouring rain. Uh, it was pretty, pretty heinous. And they were worried. They actually told his family that his execution was the next day because they were worried that they might come in and charge and try to save his life in the last moments, which is ah, pretty, pretty troubling, but you know, part of our history here. Now, finally, 20 years later, they finally decide to build a new cell house, doubling the prison's population size. So they were only supposed to have about 40 men in the territorial prison. That quickly went up to 80 men. And so they built 1890 cell house the year we, we become a state. And uh, that should have only also held 40 men. That held about 80, two men cells. And so they can max out at about 160 men. At some points, they had up to three men in these cells. And you can see the, uh, the cell doors. There are these slatted. They aren't like the bars that we have now. Um, that was common for the first three cell houses until 1928, so about 50 years of the prison's history. And a part of 1890 cell house, they also included their death row cells. So these men right here were all led to the gallows. Uh, their cells were actually on the ground level and there was a window just outside of their cell that looked out to the prison rose garden. And that is actually where they would construct the gallow about a week prior to each man's execution. Um, pretty, pretty rough stuff here. Now, a couple of years later, they begin construction on the wall that surrounds the prison here. It's about a four and a half acre site, and the wall itself is about 16 to 20 feet, we say. So the average is about 18 feet, kind of depend, depending on where you're at, and about two feet high. 
and it's all done by common flavor. Uh, let's see here. Now, a couple years after this, a prisoner named George Hamilton, this is an alias, we actually don't know his true identity. He comes in and the warden finds out that he was a really well-educated man. He had studied architecture. And so the warden put him to work. Hey, design a dining hall. These guys are in these two cramped little cell houses. You know, maybe we can cut a deal and let you out early if you do it. So he, he designs this, this giant dining hall, uh, two stories. He's got a basement room, a moat, because they don't have electricity. They don't have lights in their cells. It's just natural sunlight that goes into the basement rooms. He had a blacksmith shop and a carpentry shop on the, in the basement and a plunge bath. And on the main level was just a big wooden floor and these narrow tables. They could fit up to 320 men at a time in the dining hall. Um, George, they said, you know what? We're gonna let you go two months early before your release date. And uh, he actually told the officer before he left, you know, I'm an alcoholic. And if I don't have control of my alcoholism, I'm gonna end my own life. And the, the guard tried to talk some sense into him and the warden, he said, all right, congrats, George. He bought him a one-way ticket out of Idaho to Oregon. And he actually hopped out near Caldwell, which is about 35, 40 minutes away from here and uh, in, still in Idaho. And he checked into a hotel. He bought a bottle of whiskey and realized he was still addicted. So he bought some morphine and they found his body the next morning. Um, this is 1898. And I always explain to people that like, you know, things haven't changed. The majority of people who are in prison right now are in there due to their addiction to drugs and alcohol. Either they're committing crimes to pay for that uh, addiction or they're committing crimes while under the influence of them. And you know, this is 1898, same, same story. Now there were women, 217 that were incarcerated at this institution. And the first handful actually served with the men in that 1890s cell house. Uh, the very first one, Native American woman named Hennepi, and she actually escaped at one point and ran back to a reservation. She killed her husband. She ran back to the reservation and was arrested by uh, Indian police and brought back here. And when they found out that she just wanted to take care of her kids, they actually released her soon after. Uh, Margaret Hardy, she was from North Idaho and she was a pretty hefty mo morphine addict. And she adopted the uh, love child of her husband that he had had with a, uh, a prostitute, the sex worker, and she killed the baby. She injected it with morphine, and when the baby didn't die, she poured acid on its face. Ooh. Horrendous murder, yeah. And so she gets sentenced to the prison, and when she got here, she, she was very erratic. They had to constantly lock her up in solitary confinement, and it wasn't long after she arrived, she was eating glass and doing different things. They sent her to the insane asylum, uh, the state hospital south in Blackfoot, Idaho, south central Idaho. Um, Josie Kensler, she was in for killing her husband. She caused some controversy when she said that she was forced to have an abortion with a pregnancy that she uh, came into while incarcerated. So that warden came into some trouble and he actually lost his job due to, to Josie. And not long after her, the 16-year-old girl, Ida Larity, she came in for grand larceny and essentially she uh, was supposed to sell some stolen horses with her boyfriend. She, he said, hey, meet me in this field. We'll steal some horses. We'll sell them. She sat in the field with all these stolen horses and the sheriff arrived. Her boyfriend never showed up and she got busted for it. And when she came, the newspapers were in an uproar. How can you have a 16 year old girl incarcerated with all these men? And then you know, just a couple of years ago, there was this abortion issue. We got to build a place for the women. And so they actually built the women's ward outside the wall uh, in 1905. Um, you can kind of see the, the outside of it here. Uh, one of our most infamous women was Lida Southerd. And Lida came in after it was discovered she had uh, three husbands who suddenly died and she was collecting life insurance policies on them. <laughs> And uh, yeah, she would, had been boiling off fly paper and skimming off the arsenic and just slowly poisoning her husbands over time after, after signing them up for some life insurance. Uh, she escaped at one point. In this photo right here, you can see the man that she uh, met while she had escaped for several months. And they were just in the middle of possibly getting married. 
And this is him. This is probably one of the last photos that while well, he was her fiance, when he started un hearing the evidence against her of all of her crimes. And finally, uh, she was re brought in and he did not follow through with this, this wedding. Um, women sword completed in 1920. Uh, they, they originally put all the women in the old warden's house and just built a wall around that. That was too small. And so in 1920, they demolished that and then built what you see here on the screen. And it had four, it had seven cells and they were all just two women cells, tiny cramped little quarters. They didn't really have much for the women to do. So, you know, most of the time they spent knitting and playing piano. They could garden out in the ward itself. Uh, the men, they were all doing all the hard work and, you know, doing everything outside. The women just basically had to sit around all day. So very slow time for the women. Now that territorial prison stopped being used in like the 1930s, which is why they had a hard time figuring out which one had the time capsule in it. They had stripped all the cells out. And by 1942, they had converted it into a chapel. And you can see some of the beautiful murals that were painted on the walls by talented prisoners. Uh, these were actually painted by uh, the renowned artist around here named Blue Eagle, James Arard. And James was in for a, a robbery, a theft. And while he was here, he spent all of his time just painting murals in the chapel and um, actually was part of the Boise Art Museum and several painting competitions while incarcerated at the institution, which is a pretty, pretty interesting thing you got to be a part of. Now, uh, when you arrived at this institution, they would take your mug shot. So this is a fellow named Charles Sandusky. He was in for assault with intent to commit murder after um, beating his wife. He was actually, he beat his wife and he was locked up in the Glens Ferry Jail, which was just a few blocks from his house. He escaped the jail, returned to his wife, who's mending to her wounds, and he stabs her about 30 times. And then he runs off and he jumps in the Snake River and disappears. She survives the whole thing, which is a miracle. He finally is captured about a month later down in Texas, is brought back up and charged with assault with intent to commit murder in, in about 1915, I believe. And then in 1921, he actually wrote, he, he laid the cement out in front of that chapel and wrote CCS, May 1921. And uh, I finally, for years, I've, I've seen that. And finally uncovered it was this individual. I could see it from his Bertillion. On his left hand, he's got a tattoo that says CCS on it, just like what's in the cement out in the prison yard. When he was released in 1923, he actually returned to his wife. He returned to Glens Ferry and knocked on the door and the whole family's like get out of here you don't belong here like he had been divorced now and everything else his he kept pestering them and so his son actually came out with a shotgun and shot him right in the face blew his nose off of his face this is like days after he's released in 1923 police come they take him to the hospital they tell him you know you cannot go back to this house so he actually spends about a week in the hospital buys a ticket east uh, train ticket to spend some time with his dad and his son gets word of this boards the train and shoots his father right there in front of everybody on the train uh, because of what he had done to his mother and his son was never charged he got off on self-defense so a lot of a lot of stories like that at this institution there were a lot of young prisoners i'll get to one in just a moment um, but yeah i'll skip past this one now, 1911, they construct a new cell house. And this one had buckets, just like the other three, uh, that, or the, the other two prior to it. It didn't have any plumbing, so they had what they called honey buckets in each cell. So eight of the 80 of these toilet buckets that just kind of sat and festered in each cell. And 160 men could be incarcerated in this building. Three house across from it was the next one. Um, it was actually completed before two house, but the first construction that they did in 1909, it was made entirely of sandstone. So all of the, the cells themselves were made with brick. And the warden came in after 10 years of working on the cell house. They say, oh, yeah, we're done, warden. He comes in with a chisel and he starts chiseling around the, the, the doors. And, you know, the cell doors are just falling open. He's like, if I can do this, those, these prisoners are going to be running this place. Like so they, they stripped everything out. It was just an empty shell of a building. And in the top right there, you see Harry Orchard. Uh, he's probably our most famous prisoner. He was in here from 1905 for assassinating former 
uh, governor of Idaho, Frank Stunenberg, he had stuck a some dynamite, uh, basically a tripwire, in Frank Stunenberg's home uh, front gate. And as Frank returned home, he blew up and uh, Harry Orchard was caught soon after and admitted to everything. He actually turned state evidence against the uh, Western Federation of Miners. And so he got a life sentence instead of uh, the death penalty. He ended up spending, he died in 1954. He spent the rest of his life in the prison. So about 50 years in this institution. But while Three House was just a shell, he actually opened up a shoe, a, a boot manufacturing factory in there. And he was hiring other prisoners to help him make shoes. A lot of people in Boise said the best shoes in town made from this convicted assassin right here, Harry Orchard, would come and buy shoes from him. Now, uh, Three House actually had plumbing. So here's a, an example of, of a two house cell with one of those honey buckets. Uh -huh. As you can see, there's a lot of cell time at this institution. So you'd be in your cell from about 5 p.m. until 7.30 a.m. every day. Uh, in the later days, they started opening up and letting you go to you know, night school and things like that. But for the most part, you were in lockdown from 5 to 7 a.m. Let's see here. Uh, in the 20s, they tried to start a shirt factory in it. And that helped fund a lot of different endeavors and construction projects at the site. Uh, after the Great Depression, though, unions started to fight prison labor, and you know they were a little upset that they were competing against prisoners making these shirts and different things. But they were making thousands of shirts every single day, and everything else was put on hold while all the prisoners were making the shirts. Other jobs they could have: they had uh, automotive repair, um, farming. They they grew all of their own food. They canned all of their extra food, and that went to different school at different like the industrial school different state agencies throughout the, throughout the state of Idaho. They also started making license plates and street signs here which is something that the Idaho Department of Corrections still does uh, here. Um, laundry they had a laundry department and they uh, laundered the clothes to the local air base um, out in Cowan Field and in Mountain Home and they also had a bakery and a lot of prisoners uh, like family and a lot of former guards family say that the best donuts in town were made right here at the institution. They had an Eagle Island farm and trustees, they would be sent out to the farm and they actually had a dorm out there and that's where they raised all their food and had chickens and cattle and turkeys and other things. Part of the recreation, they had uh, golden gloves boxing out here, but the most famous thing that they had out here was their baseball team, uh, aptly named the Outlaws. And you can see the outlaws here, here on the right, that young man in the bottom, that is our second youngest prisoner, James Whitaker. And James, basically, he was a farm boy. He spent all of his time with his dad out on the farm. When, when he was 11 years old, his dad said, you know what, son, you're going to stay home and help your mom with the chores. And James wasn't going to do it. And when he and mom started butting heads, he picked up his dad's shotgun and killed his own mother. And so wow. he Old. Yeah, he comes out here. He spends nine years at this institution. And one of the things they tried to do to help rehabilitate him was teach him baseball and teach him patience and sportsmanship because he had anger issues. If he got upset, he just lost his temper and he would just go berserk. And so they said, you know what? You can't do that. If you're going to play baseball. If you want to play baseball, you got to, you know, there's no crying at baseball. Essentially, there's a great photo of him. Um, he ended up returning to his father and was like a hermit for the rest of his life. And after his death, he was buried next to his mother. Huh. The cooler, this is a punishment cell and there are six cells and they could put up to six men in each cell. They are tiny, tiny little cramped things. And prisoners said that they would have to sit and sleep sitting up if they had more than, you know, three people in there. Uh, in 1926, these individuals here, there were 16 of them, they decided that they were going to either A, try to escape, you know, by holding a guard hostage or use one of their cell doors as a battering ram and get out of there. So they stripped off all the cell doors, they reaped up all their toilets, they made weapons out of the pipes, they tied their blankets together to make ropes, and they were just about gung-ho to bust through the front door and get out of there when uh, they were stopped by guards with uh, rifles aimed at the door. 
And so they were all beaten and locked up and the prison administrator, administrators decided, you know what, group confinement maybe is not the best thing. So they built Siberia, which is just around the corner from these punishment cells. And these are about eight feet long and just over three feet wide. You'd be locked in them for 30 days minimum and you'd be fed bread, water, and baby food, which is whatever the meal in the dining hall is, just everything just kind of mixed together and, and mashed together into a, a gruel, essentially. Pretty rough space, but uh, there's a lot of graffiti left over from prisoners that served in there. Now, in the 1950s, the construction started to change and the uh, philosophy started to change. It started to become more about rehabilitation. And uh, Warden Lou Clapp here, he served as warden from 1945 to 1966. He tried to improve the spaces. So he constructed two cell houses, number four house and number five house, which is also maximum security. Number four house has four tiers and they were all four man cells. They all had plumbing. They all had uh, sinks and toilets. And they also had it wired so that they could listen to the radio. They had little headphone jacks in their cells. They could purchase headphones and plug them in. You can see a pair of headphones on this in this photo right here. Uh, maximum security also held death row. So the second floor of that building had four cells and they had one execution in that building. You can see the gallows there. And that is for this gentleman here, Raymond Allen Snowden. And Ray was from the East Coast. He uh, basically started young in crime. He started with little thefts in grocery stores and things like that. Ended up dropping out of high school, tried to join the military, punched his superior in the jaw, was dishonorably discharged, headed from Florida up to Idaho, found a job, met a woman. They were together for a while, and then he started drinking too much and getting abusive. And so after one evening, he, he beat her, and she left him. She went to Utah. A few months went by and he had gotten word that she was actually coming back to town. And so he knew that she liked to go down Garden City, it's this little city within Boise. She would go to all these different clubs every night. So he went from club to club looking for her in September of 1956. Didn't end up finding her, but he did meet this woman, Cora Dean. And Cora was out drinking. She had gotten into an argument with her boyfriend earlier in the evening. And so she was like, you know what? I'm going to have fun by myself. And so Ray came and tapped her on the shoulder and said, hey, do you want to dance? And they were seen having a great time drinking together. And at the end of the evening, Ray said, you know, I got to go. I'm going I'm to leave. But this has been great. You have no idea what I came out here to do tonight. And Cora follows him outside. They start arguing over who's going to pay for a taxi fare. And she ends up kicking him in the groin. And while he's doubled over in pain, he's intoxicated. He pulls out a two-inch pen knife. And he cuts her throat outside this bar. Nobody sees it. Nobody hears it. And he ends up mutilating her body. He stabbed her 29 to 40 times. Uh, old, you know, rags, crime rag stories have called him Boise's Jack the Ripper just because of what he had done to her. Uh, he was captured a few days later after they kind of pinpointed who he was. And he was condemned to hang. So in, on October 18th, 1957, he was the last individual who was executed at this site, uh, right there at the gallows. And he had all these siblings on the East Coast. And due to his crime, they didn't want anything to do with him. So he is actually buried in the prison cemetery, which is just outside the walls. And he's in an unmarked grave. We actually don't know where he is buried out there. And then the last few years of the prison, August 1971, it's a scorching hot day, and these prisoners are fed up with the conditions. One of their buildings just catches on fire. They think it was an electrical fire, and firefighters come in. They try to quell this, and then prisoners start throwing rocks at these firefighters. So things start to escalate, and it turns into a full-scale revolt. And by the end of it, after about a week of, of prisoners running the prison, uh, three prisoners are stabbed, and one is found rolled up in a gym mat. This fellow here, Bill Butler, um, he had been the president of the Table Rock JCs, which was the prison JC group. And I, I'm, I imagine you all know who the JCs were, Junior Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the prison got to start their own in the late 60s, and Bill Butler was in for a pretty heinous um, strangulation murder of a BSU student, a college student, and rumors had been spreading throughout the 
the prison that he was going to be sent to New York for this big JC conference. And they're like, you're going to let that, that guy do this? No way. So uh, he was ended up, he ended up being killed in that. Two years later after this riot is the final riot in the spring of 1973. And the new prison that is currently active, that was just near completion. And so the prisoners, a lot of them, half of them were already out there. The other half, the rowdy bunch, they were all left here at this old site. And the guy here in the middle holding that uh, towel, his name was uh, Larry Trujillo. Larry was out at maximum security. He had been basically um, locked up due to another prisoner being stabbed a few months earlier. He injured himself. He broke the glass. He uh, banged his head against the wall so that he could be brought back to this site. And when he came in, his brother spotted him, said, look what they're going to do to us at the new prison. And it just, that just spread through the yard. All these guys got together. They ended up burning down most of the prison yard. They burned down their dining hall. They burned down that chapel. They burned down two house and part of their uh, laundry. So if you come to visit the old pen today, uh, the majority of it is just a collection of shells of buildings because of that 1973 riot. Now that didn't stop them because uh, they ended up staying spending another nine months at this institution before they were shipped to the new site when this officially closed in December of 1973. And yeah, since then in 1974, the Idaho State Historical Society came in, swooped in. A lot of developers wanted to turn this into kind of a mall. They were going to demolish this and turn it into something else. And uh, luckily, we had some great historians who said, "No, this is an important, valuable part of our history." And We've been, you know, running it and preserving it ever since. And yeah, that is like as brief a history of the old pen as I can give. Yeah. Are there any questions? <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Is capital punishment still legal in Idaho? Yes, actually, there, there was an execution slated for June 2nd, actually, uh, this, this individual who's convicted of, of multiple uh, murders out in the, I don't know, the boonies, um, but that actually yesterday, they put it off until November, so they're going to let the uh, parole and uh, corrections board discuss it further. So, you know, we, we've only had three other executions, we've really only had 13 or actually 12 executions since we've been a state, which, you know, is like an average in Texas per month sort of thing. A little different. Yeah. So where exactly is the Idaho State Prison? I'm, I'm actually in Garden City at the moment. Oh, you are? Yeah. But, uh, but I, I, I didn't even know until Richard uh, booked you. I didn't even know there was a, a <sighs> Idaho State Prison. So... Uh, so whereabouts are you? Yeah, so we are just from like the Capitol building. We are like a, maybe a 10 minute drive. You just go down Main Street and it turns into Warm Springs Avenue. Just head down Warm Springs all past all those historic houses. Just a couple minute drive there. So we are just outside of downtown Boise. Okay, so for everybody else on the call, that means with, when you fly into Boise to come and visit me, um, it's, a, it's a, just a short drive from the airport, basically mm -hmm. what that means. Yeah. All right. It's good to know. Pat, I thought you had your hand up. You wanted a question? Pat Kogel? You're on mute, Pat. <laughs> no. no question. No, no question. No. All right. Well, you know, your, your aunt, old prison it looks a, a lot better than the uh, San Quentin that's right down the street from where I am. <laughs> so I go by it. I bet. In fact, to get to Home Depot, I have to take the San Quentin exit. Oh. <laughs> and then look around. It's the last exit before uh, you cross over the, uh, the bridge to uh, uh, whatever city's over the other side. Still haven't got my bearings here yet. But anyway, that's, uh, that's really interesting. They put together an a, a, a interesting, uh, interesting mm -hmm. set of historical documents on this thing. Who did the baseball team play? You, Where did they play? Who did they play? 
you know, they would they would play the Boise State University students. They would play the College of Idaho. There's a liberal arts school out near Caldwell. They would play them. Uh, local teams, touring teams would come in and, you know, the, the prison authorities would be like, hey, you want to stop in and play the prisoners? And anybody could play baseball. Any, no matter the crime, you could play. And they, if anything happened, they knew it was going to shut down. So they were always on their best behavior. And they were really good, actually. But, I mean, they also got to play with the same teammates, you know, sometimes for a decade, you know. So a little different than when you're a college kid and you have a different team every year. <laughs> And they were actually occasionally sent out to Julia Davis, which is this big park right in central downtown Boise as well. Uh, so pretty, pretty interesting. A bunch of armed guards standing around watching a baseball game, but it would happen. Are you still getting uh, uh, more information about uh, historical facts about the prison as you're, as you're working your job? Absolutely. Yeah, every day we meet a lot of uh, new former prisoners, former uh family of guards, former guards have come in. And so I've, I've actually been collecting a lot of oral histories from former prisoners and former guards and, you know, tons of insight. If, if anyone here listens to podcasts, I actually run a, a podcast here called Behind Gray Walls. And I basically tell different stories of prisoners every week. And then I, on the weekends, I interview form like current correctional officers and different people within prison and uh, just different sort of stories. So if you're, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I've got a, a whole podcast about it and about 70 episodes you can check out. Nice. Yeah. Nice. How many people work there in the, in the prison with you? Yeah, there are three full-time staff members. So myself and, and two others. And then most of our staff is part-time. Uh, they work, you know, front desk. Um, and, and we actually have a pretty big group of volunteers who come out uh, just you know, most of them retired folks who, who wanted something to do with their, their time and they give tours out here and, and help at the front desk and different things. So we're always encouraging folks who are interested in history to come out and, and spend some time with us. Do you have, uh, do you have fundraisers where you have people spend the night in the, in the jail cells to raise money? We do. Yeah, yeah. we occasionally have an event called 30 or Sleepless in Stripes. And uh, we, you know, you come in, we process you, we take all of your things. We take your mug shot, give you a number, and feed you, you know, stale bread and water, and <laughs> give you a honey bucket. <laughs> we no, we we decided not to do the honey bucket thing. <laughs> Health concerns, you know. <laughs> well, Anthony, you're a great storyteller. We really enjoyed the the stories that you you told about the the history of the of the prison and and. Uh, you know, I think that it's. Uh, I'm. I'm definitely going to come and visit. Yeah, it'd be, uh, it'd be cool to do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thanks. It was. It was a great, great presentation. Great. Oh, thanks. Thanks for reaching out to me, Richard. Okay, so, <laughs> my so pleasure. We're Thank you. At the end of our time, and and does anybody else have any any more questions they'd like to ask of uh, Anthony? Well, that was that was quite a talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody did, and and. Uh, it was, Really, it's uh, Richard again has done an outstanding job of procuring excellent speakers and presentations for our for our writer group. And thank you, Richard, and and thank you, Anthony.